Hello everyone and welcome back to Suzerain here with the Republic of Swordland here in episode 4 and with Anton Rain who is of course still serving as a president where we are working on our high speed railway system. We did try to say we were going to potentially look at signing a trade deal with Whelan uh, and we did have a meeting regarding trying to increase the executive power and take power away from the Supreme Court which caused some friction within our government. Uh, we are going to read the L1 construction plan started by the SSC. The Sorter State Corporation has reported that preparatory work for the L1 railway has already started, including clearing land and transporting equipment. Construction of the railway will be starting the next months from Polesword. In Conriat, we can read Promising and Industrial Potential. The mayor of Conriac, Chris Shaw, reports that the decision to start the construction of the L1 high-speed railway project caused industrial investors all over the country to invest money in regions near the city. The mayor is hopeful that the completion of the project will result in substantial economic growth in Conriac. More bell, nature preservation protest. The Nature Preservation Foundation is protesting against the remaining coal industry, a significant contributor to Swordish energy. The group is voicing concerns about the environmental impact of the industry. The protest is gaining momentum and drawing attention to the need for sustainable energy alternatives. The future of the coal industry operations in Morbell is uncertain. Boomkirk. We have an incident at the President's Souls Mansion on Duru Island. A private boat near Tarka and Souls Mansion on Duru Island prompted the Coast Guard to fire warning shots. Despite the initial alarm, former President Tarka and Seoul allowed the boat to approach for a brief conversation. The occurrence has raised questions about the security protocols near the obscure mansion. Details of the conversation remain undisclosed. Interesting. That that could be that could be something, right? That 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 could definitely be something. Uh, meeting with Chief Justice Orso Hawker. The administration has been working day and night on the overwhelming amount of issues that were facing the country. The department sent several documents which required by signature so they could start working on the new decisions that were taken. After I cite dozens of them, I closed my eyes to relax for a moment. Another long day. Even though I really wished to leave the palace for the day, Lucian had earlier told me that the Chief Justice wanted to speak to me. We planned to meet in my office in 30 minutes. I waited for him, wondering what subject he would raise. We're going to just take a moment to relax. I stretched my arms and looked out the window. Thousands of shimmery lights in the whole sort of skyline were mesmerizing. Suddenly, I heard a knock on the door. It was Lucian. Good evening, sir. Good evening. I'm sorry that I couldn't explain the situation to you in detail earlier, sir. The Chief Justice insisted on seeing you this evening. I do not know what he has to say, but it'll probably be about the new Constitution. He'll be coming shortly with Judge Mr. Garassi to the meeting. We shouldn't take them lightly. Uh, I think he's here to test the waters. I agree. They will probably try to get you to their side. We should. There were three knocks at the door. Lucian checked his watch. He looked rather worried. Libby opened the doors. Chief Justice Orso Hawker and Judge Harrod Garassi entered the room. Good evening, Mr. President. It's great to see you. Evening. Uh... Good to see you, gentlemen. Good to see you indeed. Or so just at the so sofa in the office, may I? I'm just going to nod. We all took our seats on two opposite sofas and made ourselves comfortable. How were your first couple of months, Mr. President? I hope you're faring well. I'm doing well. No need to worry, Mr. Grassi. That's great to hear, Mr. President. We also think you've been doing a good job so far. Considering all that's happening around us, with the shootings near the palace and soldiers on our borders, you let out a deep sigh. It is a troubling time. Indeed it is. We appreciate your concern. So, you probably know why we are here. You're here to stop the new constitution. We're only here to tell you that the Supreme Court does not approve of the attempt to change the constitution. With all due respect, the Constitution needs to be updated, sir. I'm sure you are well aware of the public demand in our circumstances. And the public demanded to give more powers to the President? Spare me the lecture. I know you have different ideas. And er, er, uh, asterisks. Even if your proposal passes the Assembly, I will make sure it, is, it will not pass the Supreme Court. That much is clear. The 
You haven't even seen the proposal yet, Mr. Hawker. Isn't it too soon to be against it? Do you think I live under a rock, Mr. President? I know what goes on. Yet you, Mr. President, seem to be only partially informed about the current situation. Please let us explain the reasons of our stance. I believe I'm fully informed about this situation, Mr. Grassi. You don't want to give up your power. You think you are, Mr. President, but the Chief Justice has a bit telling something that you'd be very interested in. And what would that be? Orso signaled Heron with his hand to let him speak instead. Mr. President, I know that you are busy, man, so I will make this quick. We all know that the Swedish security forces found stashes of Rubergian weaponry in the hideouts of the British separatists. K-74s are warming inside sword lead at this moment. As much as Ruberg poses a direct threat now, it's clear that they are also intervening in our country and weaponizing our minorities against us. It's not unprecedented to think that the Blues will start their terror again within their new toys. Not to mention the fights that broke out between the left and right wing after the shooting of Bernard Circus, communists are rising with the support of United Cantana, the chaos is evident for Swordland. And sadly, we don't see the administration taking the necessary precautions. You said you will not focus on military during your term. You're under current circumstances that cannot be tolerated at any cost. Mr. Hawker, the court has no jurisdiction over these matters. Aren't we all part of this state, Mr. President? We are all responsible for the fails to overcome these threats. But regardless of that, you, are you also aware that the armed Blutish separatists have direct connections to the Workers' Party of Blutia? Everyone knows that. You all you know what that means. Do you remember the vote of the Workers' Party in the last election? What is this all about? The only reason they are not in the Assembly is because of the electoral threshold they have gotten quite big. They are clearly getting outside help, but their connections to the paramilitary Blutish force cannot be denied. And all of a sudden, the reformers are trying to decrease the electoral threshold so that the Blutish separatists can be legitimized in the assembly to achieve their aims of independence. I am not working with reformists, Mr. Hawker. I am aware, yet you're proceeding with your own version of changes to the Constitution, are you? I am. The new constitution will not be weaker, but stronger. You already have the power of the decree, Mr. President. As long as we work together, we can allow you to enact major changes with the presidential decree. But I wish the only issue were with the Blutish terrorists at Roomberg. The reformers suggested changes would also bring the communists who are backed by United Cantana into the assembly. Do you see the pattern yet? You are saying the reformists are working for foreign powers. Have you been briefed by your own security team? Maybe you should suspect them as well. We should take the necessary measures against communist and bluish plots as well as increasing our military budget against a possible conflict with Rumber. And of course, that followed to the traps of the reformists by listening to their debates. They are clearly plotting to weaken the president and our horrible administration in order to exploit the situation. Which brings us to some very important information that we have. It is definitely something you need to hear and it can change absolutely everything. With all due respect, Mr. President, I think this is getting slightly ridiculous. Um, I'll just have him explain so I can hear his point. The person in question is Mr. Freya's Richter himself, the leader of the reformists. We have enough information to infer that he has ties with Arcasia. Arcasia is aggressively growing their influence around the world, and now we have Mr. Richter coming out with these ridiculous demands for a new constitution amidst the chaotic period in Swordland. All the pieces seem to fit perfectly. That is why the Supreme Court will be doing what it takes to stop these reforms and preserve the Constitution. How would you know that Mr. Richter has ties to Arcasia? Mr. Glad, we all know he has been Arcasia many times because it's been documented, but what would you think if he has been making hidden flights to the country? He was hiding his flights to Arcasia? He was. He has been spotted at a hotel in Arcasia last year when they held the Conference on Economic Development in Volatile Regions. Right around that time, he started to influence the masses into believing that our Constitution is the reason for everything bad. Uh, that's, I mean, that's a stretch, right? Like, sure, okay, maybe he was there, but saying, oh, he was there around this, and then he starts saying that. Could it be something? Yeah, but that's, yeah, that's... That's a stretch. His trip was not documented, nor was he an official guest of the conference. We believe that he had a meeting with President Walker behind closed doors. 
I also have a couple of more photos of him that were taken in her case in different cities. One is from a couple of months back. Again, none of it is documented. He also attended another event in Lesbia last week. Their case she administered of foreign affairs was there too. How could any of these be undocumented? We don't know. Even if he used a private plane, he would be able to get the information out of his flights. That means he has people helping them from the inside. Many solists were already following his leads for quite some time. Mr. President, can I give away their identities, but I can give you the evidence. He handed me a small file. It contained official documents from the Sorish Border Guard, which highlighted dates that showed no trace of Fritz Victor's name. There were clear photos of him that were taken at the conference in Arcasia, as well as remarks by lesbian and Arcasian citizens who claimed to have seen him with Arcasian businessmen around the same dates. There's also an official transcript from one of his speeches where he claimed to be in bed fee on the dates of the conference in Arcasia where he was spotted. Lucian skimmed through the documents with skepticism, which slowly turned into surprise. These seem to be real. Of course they are real, Mr. God. These seem to suggest that Arcasia is behind the reformists. Their demands will only benefit Arcasia. They want us to have a weaker administration while we face all these threats. This is clearly a plot against Sorlet. I bet Rumberg has part of their play too. This cannot be a coincidence that they are weaponizing our minorities against us around the same time. And now you understand the reasons of our current states, and also our suspicions about your advisors who clearly have not given you this vital information. Lucian gave him a sharp look. We appreciate the information, Mr. Hawker, but I advise against jumping to conclusions right away. We still need to check the information. There is not much to think or check. This clearly is an emergency. In such cases, the Constitution gives the President the right to use his emergency powers. If we work together, you can be sure that the Supreme Court will not block your declaration of emergency. I am not going to go and declare a state of emergency. Well, I'll say you want me to declare an emergency. Of course, we cannot wait for the process of the Assembly to take care of these issues. You must exercise your presidential powers for a fast and effective solution. Which means you might need to suspend parts of the Constitution to give more authority to our security forces to deal with these issues. We must officially investigate Mr. Richter as well. You could devise a strong security decree if you base it on the Articles 57 and 58, which gives the President the right to suspend parts of the Constitution to deal with national security threats. You could directly bypass the Assembly in such a situation. The only thing you need is the Supreme Court to allow the emergency to be cleared, and you have our word on that. Sir, I think this is going a bit too far. We shouldn't escalate things so fast. Mr. President, we, why don't we talk in private, only the two of us? We can devise a plan together. I know how we can use the Constitution to our advantage. It would be more effective if Mr. Galad and Mr. Garasi leave the room before we discuss it. Sir, I advise against it. So I do want to consolidate power, right? I, I, I have been going down that path of consolidating power a little bit. However, I feel like, I don't know if this is a setup, but I feel like it could be because they know that I'm going to try to take their power away. So they're trying to get me to go down this path. Um, and then they can say, well, look, he's trying to become a dictator. This is why he's trying to take the Supreme Court's power away. And I think they're trying to get me to say that. So, um, I'm going to say, I'm sorry to say that we won't be cooperating, Mr. Hawker. Even though you're aware of our national security threats, you are making a big mistake, Mr. President. We will not allow you to succeed. Gentlemen, I think it's about time to end this meeting. So, they're saying, yeah, this is why I feel like it was a setup, because they're like, oh... You know, our country is going to get weaker, and, you know, we have all these security threats and all of this. And I say, I'm not going to declare a state of an emergency and, you know, bypass the assembly. And they're like, oh, well, we're not going to allow you to succeed. Well, thank you for having us, Mr. President. Have a good evening. They both left the room without saying anything else. Lucian, that was not good. They clearly tried to threaten you. We have to make sure our reforms will pass the court. 
or so be doing whatever it takes to damage you. We need to be careful. There are still many old guard sympathizers in our party. We can't let them divide our party. And he will definitely try. After a short evaluation of the situation on our hands, Lucian left me the presidential office. It was obvious that the old guards would be my main rivals in the near future. So I don't disagree that we have issues, right? Especially if the reformists are, and that's why I didn't want to work with the reformists. Although I don't know how much I 100% believe quite everything they were trying to spin. But I do believe that, you know, there might be something going on with reformists, right? That's certainly within the realm of possibility. However, I don't believe that, you know, every trip he makes there means he's secretly working with them you know, to destabilize the country, right? Because clearly, that would, you know, have the potential of coming out, and, you know, he would know that, he being Franz Richter. And again, if the justices had come to me before the meeting, where we talked about, hey, we want to weaken the Supreme Court, their concerns would be more valid, right? Because you could say, okay, you know, they really have the best interests in the country, that's all they're thinking about, right? You know, there's no hidden but the fact that there came after that, right, kind of makes me think that there is some kind of an agenda there, and there might have been a little bit of a setup, especially how they react. Trials of Democracy. Sounds ominous. I do not have any personal wealth, and we have a government budget of two. Communist books burn in Boran. Local residents gather thousands of books that they claim to be spreading communist and malignivist propaganda at the Century Park in Boran that set the books on fire. Book burning, never really a good idea. Um, aggressive slogans targeting the Red Youth, the Workers' Party of Bludia, and the Communist Party of Sordid were shouted. Youth groups from the local party offices of the USP and NFP also joined in with the burning. The fire department was dispatched and the protesters dispersed on their own. Well, at least there wasn't like a massive, you know, confrontation there. Still not good. Sarna, Bludish resistance at sanctuaries, Bergen security forces have arrested three priests at two different dirty Sanctuaries had started after fighting links to insurgent activities. The report came from an elderly man who wanted to pray peace, but instead found himself invited to join the Buddhist Freedom Front by state-sanctioned priest. Further incidents indicate that the BFS is pushing for a lo BFF is pushing for a local recruitment drive in different sanctuaries across the region. In Erloy, Young Swords and NFP flags burn a massive counter protest against Young Swords led by a local politician known to be allied with the Red Youth. Resulted in many injuries and property damage. Subsequently, Young Swords and National Front Party flags were burnt, which caused tensions to escalate. Local police dispersed the protesters by sundown. Lock Haven, recession hits farmers again. As per the latest news from Blockhaven, the farming industry has taken another hit as a result of the recession. There are reports that 60% of all wheat in Blockhaven is rotting in barns due to a lack of buyers. Farmers are requesting additional funds from the government to survive the year. Narbel lacks uh, hospitals. The mayor of Narbel reported that their hospitals are overburdened and they are unable to respond to the needs of the citizens. He complained about months long waiting lists for terminally ill patients. On top of the capacity issues, it was also noted that the facilities are still largely using outdated technology. 
So I think from our cities, that is all the news. We'll go to our barbecue with Frank. It was a Saturday afternoon, my first break from work in what felt like years of the weather could have been more perfect. Tried to keep my mind off the upheaval sparked by the circus assassination. I lit the backyard grill. Monica and Deanna were out shopping for craft supplies and I'd given the staff the day off. It was just myself and Frank at home. I wasn't sure how he felt about me at the moment, but I did know how he felt about barbecued ribs. Our cook had left some marinating in the refrigerator. Sure enough, as soon as Frank glimpsed the grill of the meat, he stepped outside and joined me. Time to spend some quality time with your old man, have you? Sure, if you could spare a few minutes out of your busy schedule. Um, I will say, because I have been trying to be a family man, right? I've been kind of trying to balance pushing the country to a slightly more authoritarian you know, state, but not completely because I'm not trying to undermine, you know, the assembly as much as keep my veto power as I get the Supreme Court kind of sidelined a little bit. You know, I'm not trying to sideline everybody, but, but I am trying to be a family man at the same time. I'm sorry, you know, I haven't been around very often lately, but I'm happy to see you now. It's okay, I know you've got the most stressful job in the country, and you've got to feed your family on top of all. It all. We both chuckled. I turned to Ted to the fire. Here, let me try. He grabbed the fan and started quickly waving it over the coals. The fire roared to life. He turned to look at me with a grin on his face as if he was expecting praise. Not bad, son, not bad. Thank you, sir. It is our utmost interest to fulfill our duties with precision. The grilling shall commence in exactly one minute and 32 seconds. That was a spot-on impression, impersonation of Lucian. We looked at each other for a second, then burst out laughing. I realized that my throat was parched. There's a six-pack of beer in the kitchen. Um, I'm really going to invite my son to have a drink. I mean, how old is he? He's currently studying in high school. So I'm not going to invite him to drink. I'm going to get up and get one myself. I opened and sat down and gazed out at the city skyline with my son. For a moment, my thoughts flashed back to my childhood and my relationship with my old father. My father was a poor man who struggled to provide for us on his meager income. He put me to work on a farm long before I was Frank's age, and even then we couldn't always make ends meet. Yet we were always close as a family. Now that I was a president, I knew Frank would never face the same hardships I had. I couldn't deny that I felt a bit jealous. Dad, yeah, could I ask you something? We are a family, you could ask anything. It's just, I feel like there's so much you've been hiding from me about your past and what's going on right now. Like at dinner that other night after the ball, you told me everything was under control, but it wasn't, was it? I know what happened in the 20s, we learned all about it in school. Now with the protests and the riots, is it all going to be, is it going to be the same thing? Dad, is there going to be civil war in Swordland? Um... I hope not. He let out a sigh. But what was it like back then? Uncle Peter said the two of you went through a lot. I'm not a kid anymore, you could tell me. Before I could gather my thoughts, the familiar images started flashing before my eyes. Images of soldiers advancing towards me and my friends, weapons drawn, of people I knew, friends and neighbors being dragged through the streets and murdered in the alleyways. <clears throat> and that little girl's face. Those were dark times. It seems like it. You're nearly a grown man. Let's talk about it. Frank leaned forward in his chair, his eyes wide. Um, we'll, ta we'll talk about the Civil War. It was right after I met your mother. We had both joined the same political debate group to push for a change after the coup of 27. Eventually, I became convinced that I wasn't doing enough, so I joined the Young Swords. Then one night it happened. Two different factions of the army, one of them led by the fascist General Luteran and the other by Socialist General Rickard, started fighting against each other. It was a bloodbath. Nowhere was safe. Frank sh shifted in his seat, visibly uncomfortable. So we organized a protest. One day against Rickard, we were fed with our army, toying with the country again. 
We're not going to tell them about the girl. That'll be a bit too much. I paused for a minute before continuing. It was horrible. They were waiting for us. Everything plunged into chaos. Soldiers started beating and shooting at everyone. There were some things my son did not have to know. Agreed. That's enough for today. It's okay. I'm sorry. I should have asked you about it. I know I don't understand how easy my life is sometimes. One more thing, though. I know you enjoyed the Young Swords back then. Do you mind if I ask why? Um... Right. I'm going to say I felt that the country was under attack by communists and I had to defend the country. Frank raised his eyebrows, his curiosity still not satisfied, but sensing my reluctance to go on, he simply nodded. Sorry for bombarding you with questions. I know I complained sometimes, but my problems are nothing compared to what you went through. I'm here to listen to them no matter what they are. What problems? And you're damn right, your generation will never understand. Um... I'm not quite old enough to pick this one, so I'll say I'm here to listen no matter what they are. Before Frank could say anything else, I heard the front door unlock. Deanna, Monica's voices, and the sounds of rustling, choppy bangs filled the house. All right, I'll be upstairs until dinner. Frank went in and dashed upstairs. I took a long sip from my beer looking at the city in the now setting sun. I hope that talking to Frank about my past had been the right decision. Part of me felt, lo felt as if some sort of burden had been lifted, but I had the same nightmares again that night. Oh, no, we have Narbel. I guess we're gonna go, we're gonna visit Narbel. Okay. Uh, Morna industrial output concerns. The mayor Morna has reported that their industrial output numbers this year are 12% lower than last year. They are requesting additional support to improve their industrial capacity, including machinery and personal personnel to combat the downward trend. The construction of several new factories aboard the mayor stated his belief that an economic upturn in the city is still possible if government investments succeed. According to current projections, board is set to lose an additional 2% of industrial output next year. However, recent data from the municipality suggests that an investment worth several billions of SR will stop the downward trend and increase the industrial output in a short amount of time. It's suffering from low industrial output, decreasing job openings, and has widespread protests. Um, but we do, the mayor is a member of the USP. Intel prisoners riot at Intel Rock Prison yesterday around 11 a.m. A prison riot started the Ward C of the Intel Rock Prison, which was eventually suppressed. Ward C is generally used for keeping political prisoners, and the riot star was awarded. Was killed by a Buddhist political prisoner. Four guards and 21 prisoners died. 134 were injured. That's not good. Um, we're going to read the report about our railroad. SSC's project manager for the Elwood Railway has reported that the project has been progressing well. They've already started laying down the foundation of the ground retraining walls, bridges, and tracks. Project supervisors from the government confirmed the report, say most of the preliminary work has already been done by the SSC. However, the government officials added that there were a couple of delays related to the transportation of construction materials, which were not included in the SSC's report. Well, that last part's not great. Uh, read the report of the reforms. Many USP, many members of the USP, led by Albert Calvin and the reformist wing of the party, clarified their debates with the government and the party congress for the upcoming constitutional reform. Albert Calvin stated that without ministry reforms, they won't be able to stand behind the new reform package. The legislative debate of the repeal of the EPA. The Grand National Assembly was a stage of the contentious debate over the proposed repeal of the Energy Protection Act of 1932. Arguments both for and against the repeal put forth with Fred Richter of the PFJP and the USP reformist wing leader Albert Calvin, leading the faction advocating for the repeal. 
They argued that such a move would foster economic growth and increase foreign investment. However, the United Sourland Party and National Front Party, under the leadership of Gloria Tory and Kisaro Kimder, respectively, defended the act vehemently, citing the need for Sourland to protect its strategic industries from foreign control. The final decision now hinges on the vote, which will be held the following month. I don't think I'm gonna. I, I don't think I want to support that. But we are gonna go to Darbell. I was traveling to the snow-covered city of Darbell in the largest region for the Rural Development Forum organized by the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education. The mountainous city of Darbell had gritty tones to it. It was the most regarded as one of the poorer cities of Sorland. Its people were hardy and wary. Even after the discovery of natural resources in the area, years of neglect by the central government were repaired at one build on the buildings and the general infrastructure. Natural resources, namely gas and oil, will now under the control of gas sub, which elevated the corporation to a place of power. My task in this forum was mainly symbolic, fake smiles and handshakes with oil barons, meeting with local politicians, but most importantly of all, making sure that Darbell did not feel like it was forgotten by the government. The scenery so far was a reflection of Darbell's neglect. Main roads from the city were not maintained well. There were many bumps and empty discolored spots in the asphalt. Navigating and swerving to avoid the inconveniences, our motorcade finally started nearing the city. As if my discomfort from the bumpy ride was apparent to him, Serge rolled out the partition window. We will be arriving at Hotel West in a few minutes, sir. Thank you for letting me know. I'm not going to complain. It's not his fault. Anytime. It is my duty. After a moment, Serge started to smile under his mustache. What is that smile for? Sir, I just wanted to say it has been great these last two months. As you know, my wife Suzanne recently gave birth to her son, sir, and now my daughter just started at a very good high school at Holdsword. That's great news, Serge. I am happy for you. I appreciate it, sir, truly. I was worried that I wouldn't be able to afford a good private school if she scored less than the entrance exams. But I should have made my insecurity get to me. Erica outsports me all the time. I'm very proud to have a daughter like her. I also hope that Deanna will grow to be like her mother someday. I'm sure she will, sir. After all, she is a daughter of a lion and a lioness. My daughter looks up to the First Lady for inspiration. It's not just limited by daughter, sir. She's an inspiration for almost all women in the country. But at the same time, it must be hard for the First Lady as well. All this attention to Jussie to this new high-profile life and a husband that is great responsibility. It is hard for both of us. It must be, sir. We sometimes forget the important people live in life between all the responsibility and rush. You know, those we care for. I agree. Serge continued after a moment of silence. Have I told you, sir, we dated my son, George? The doctor said he is very healthy and thankfully so is my wife. That's good. I hope the hospital had a good service. Normally, we would have been treated at one of the suburban hospitals, but thanks to the special coverage of the presidential staff, we were transferred to the Enrolled State Hospital. I'll say... We need to increase the quality of the services for all. Again, I'm not going full-on dictator. I'm trying to tread maybe a fine line. And I'm not sure I'm going to be playing. I am playing well enough to do that. That sounds like a tough issue to solve. Serge side. I've already started thinking about their university education, especially Erica. I would have sent her to a good private school, but with the current state of the economy, it's going to be hard for us. We will fix the economy one way or the other. If anyone can, that's you, Mr. President. The car hit a major pothole in the butt, which lifted us up in our seats for a second. Um, I'll say this is unacceptable. We need to invest in infrastructure here. I agree, sir. We still need to drive back tomorrow unless you use one of those new helicopters. The motorcade began approaching the hotel. The Hotel West was supposedly the best hotel at Darbell. The large 25-story main building was undoubtedly one of the taller and more expensive buildings in the city. It towered over the nearby slums that had been a target for protests when it was first built. A crowd was gathered in front of the hotel with the welcoming committee at etc. As we approached the red carpeted entrance, I could see the mayor of Darbell and his top aides. Serge got out of the car and opened the door. He bowed his head respectfully and joined a gesture towards the entrance. See you later, Serge. Thank you, sir. Likewise. 
As soon as I left the vehicle, the fresh air of Darbell filled my lungs. Almost immediately, everyone present in the crowd flocked over to me with an excessive display of courtesy, smiles, and handshakes while I donned the mask of a politician. A mask that I was very used to. Well, we're in Narbel, so I feel like we need to deal with this first. Briefing on the current welfare situation. I arrived at the meeting room for my talk with the Sierra and Pascal. Before beginning, I took a moment to appreciate the view from the balcony. The mountains of Narbel were completely covered with snow. While I was mesmerized by the cedar, Pascal Benawal walked up to me. Who is this? He's a minister of health. My minister of health was, ironically, somewhat portly, having gained a few pounds since his breakthrough as a best-selling writer, but his authority in social affairs could not be questioned. Such a spectacular view. Sierra Waddle, the Minister of Education, joined us on the balcony dressed in a sky blue pantsuit. Her preference for trousers over dresses has made her the subject of much palace gossip, but it didn't seem to bother her in the slightest. Spectacular indeed, but if you look in the opposite direction, you'll see what souls decades of neglect did to the city. Most of the people living in Arbel are workers, farmers, and their wives and children. They're breaking their backs for close to no pay, all thanks to greedy corporations. My intention is to help the working class. I'm glad we see eye to eye on the issue. If you look past the view, you can see the real problems. Real problems like poverty. Pascal nodded gravely. This was a subject he knew quite a bit about himself. His best known books were about the plight of Sorlin, thus fortunate, dried from his own past growing up in squalor. As did I, let's not forget that. Well put, Miss Walda, I don't need to tell you about my own experiences with poverty, and you've been through similar hardships yourself, Mr. President. Exactly. We have all got through... It feels like the cards are stacked against you. Exactly. It feels as if there's no way out. You don't have to be bored, poor, to sympathize with the plight of the impoverished, much as you don't have to have been bored a woman to recognize Sorlin's need for parity among the sexes. Parity among the sexes shouldn't be our first priority. Look at how many highly ranking female politicians our country has. Appearances can be deceiving, Pascal. I mean, that's true. That's true. That's fair. And her voice sounded bitter. Think about how Lilius Graf got to her current position. I don't necessarily believe the rumors about her in Seoul, but she never could have risen so high if she didn't pair at his cause. Gloria Tori, is it an accident? The first female assembly speaker is in such a staunch conservative. And then there is Alfonso's habit of promoting women to prominent positions to give Sorlin a progressive sheet while accomplishing nothing in reality. While women in places like Darbell are denied any opportunity to advance, the government can use a handful of female politicians from wealthy families, myself included, to pretend their only obstacle to success is their own lack of initiative. Meanwhile, those of us who don't use our clout to help powerful men stay in power are denigrated as angry spinsters. I ask you, Mr. President, does anyone care that your strategist, Mr. Glade, doesn't have a wife? I'll say that she's veered off topic. Mr. Benoit asked, I answered. As I was saying, isn't it about time Pulse Forward address this country's real issues? Rather than bowing to the wishes of the hawks and fearmongers in the establishment and diverting yet more resources to the military and law enforcement. Our welfare, healthcare, and education systems have been decayed since the recession, so these poor communities are losing hope. Hopelessness and a lack of opportunities can drive people to extreme solutions. We're seeing increased crime, domestic violence, and yes, raising the rising inequality between men and women. Those issues need to be tackled from different directions. We need to engage it holistically. I'm planning to help by using a decreased budget to improve the quality of health care. That could prove useful, but we need to be doing a lot more education and similar issues. There's another subject I want to mention. I've been working on improving the rights of workers in our country to propose a draft bill that is currently being reviewed by our party. Mr. Clavin has already backed me and given his support. Sword that has followed behind most countries on this subject it is my responsibility to ensure that this is not the case. There is always room for improvement, and it is good to hear that you are pushing for it. Appreciate the kind words, Mr. President. I will not let you down. It is also a matter of life and death. Every decade we hear of some horrific accident due to employers' disregard for their workers' safety. So you would back the bill when it arrives on your desk, Mr. President? Um...
So far, I've been very pro-business, right? I gave bailouts to the businesses. I supported the railway. So I'm going to say to make a decision, I would need to evaluate the contents in detail. Understandable, you'll receive all the sections in an outline. It's getting a little cold out here. Let's head inside and continue our discussions. We headed back inside. The meeting room was already prepared for state business. Small gifts for each of us have been placed on the table by the municipality. We took our seats. Tell me more about your plans, Sierra. With pleasure. Soros education is free, but we have a very outdated system that I want to reform. The other important issue is the lack of access to education in rural areas, especially for young girls. Your administration has the power to solve both problems. My highest priority is to get enough funding to be able to build schools in rural areas while I cleanse our educational system of its nationalistic indoctrination and sexist teachings. What is the literacy rate of Swordland? Uh, the literacy rate of Swordland is at 80%. This is a very good indicator for future growth, but it needs to increase. It's also far lower among girls than boys. If I remember correctly, the most illiterate areas are Bergia and Angland. That is correct, although Lockhaven skews the statistics for the largest region, which also has a vast number of illiterate citizens. This underlines my point about the lack of access to education. How many students and teachers do we have? Currently, there are about 5 million students, 3 million primary education, 1 million in secondary, and 1 million in tertiary. There are 155.316 teachers. Um, how do you... Oh, 155,316. That makes more sense. I was going to say, how do you have a point? <laughs> how do you have a point person? A sword that is full of young and bright minds. It is indeed. It indeed is full of potential. I think there needs to be a change in the way of thought. We should help children question and educate themselves. Tell me about the difference between urban and rural education. Urban areas have three times the number of schools per 10,000 people compared to rural areas. Rural areas also suffer from a lack of teachers. That's not a great ratio. This is one of the most important problems we face. If not the most important, a huge part of the population is forgotten in terms of welfare. Thank you, Sierra. I can fill the blanks from here. I want to hear about the health care system. As you wish, Mr. President, Sorlin has a free health care system except for a few private hospitals operating under it. Most of the populace reserves adequate treatment. Health issues primarily appear in rural areas due to a lack of quality services. I'm doing my best to ensure that citizens of all ages receive the best health care they can. I also personally want to solve the high infant and maternal mortality problem. Uh, um, what's the life expectancy and mortality rate? Our life expectancy is 65 years, and the infant mortality rate is worrying 121 per 1,000 births, while mater maternal mortality is at 5 per 1,000. Be assured that we are doing everything we can to save mothers and their newborn. Those numbers are saddening indeed. I expect nothing but your best efforts to improve the situation. We are working very hard at improving the quality of the services. How many hospital beds are there per 10,000? There are 10 beds per 10,000 citizens, which is a very good number according to our comparisons with our other neighbors. We see a lower number in the countries, counties of Agnolia and Wheel or no, countries of Agnolia and Wheelan, but obviously can't match Lesbia or Vogsla. Agnolia and Wheelan are hardly countries to take as a standard, but it is good to know we aren't in a huge health crisis yet. How many doctors and nurses are employed? We have 31,594 doctors and 73,680 nurses working for the Ministry of Health. That's a high number, which I think is. I don't want to be rude, but out of all those numbers, how many are in urban and rural areas? Good point, Sierra Pascal. The data shows that per 10,000 people in urban areas are about 11 doctors, while in rural areas there are only three. Treatment time is still too high due to the low number of doctors in rural areas, which barely get any proper coverage. Thank you, Pascal. Your in-depth briefing is much appreciated. I believe that is everything. Sierra stood up and moved towards the window. She took a deep breath. What is it, Sierra? Look at this impoverished city. The streets full of potholes, the hospital barely functioning, the school half open. This is not just about solar, even a fossil failing. This is a decay at store that's forgotten regions has been going on for many decades due to structural corruption, which is fueled by capitalism.
Let's not get into an ideological debate. We need to focus on the issues. One cannot be separated from the other. Mr. Rain, this issue stem from the ideology. Sierra sat back down inside. One way or the other, we need to transform. Greed and unchecked capitalism will not magically provide for the people. What are you working towards, Pascal? I personally want to improve the low quality of healthcare in the rural areas, so I created draft plans to increase the salary of doctors to upgrade the equipment of the hospitals. I can do more with an increased budget, additionally a privatization plan to promote private investment in the healthcare system can allocate extra funds. Isn't access an issue in rural areas? Access is an issue, but not as critical as the quality of these areas. The lack of experienced personnel or equipment causes bad treatment, resulting in many deaths. I do hope to create competition to increase the quality of health care with a privatization effort. A private health care system would increase the price of treatment and make access worse for the average citizen. The decision not to promote more state control would cost the people dearly. I guess I have to hear her plans, even though I don't think I agree with them. My plan requires an increase in the government budget. I aim to solve the problems we highlighted with the allocated money. By building schools in these less fortunate rural areas and through fundamental changes to the education system, I unlock the potential of all of our children, boys and girls alike. I mean, I don't necessarily like the idea of you know, necessarily increasing state control everywhere, but at the same time, I do agree that, you know, rural education needs to improve. But we did also say we were going to focus on education. So I will go with number two. Our election mandate was to improve education. We will deliver on this. This brings hope to the table, which needs to be followed by action. There's much to be done, and if we are given the budget, there will be opportunities to implement policies that push education to the next level. Wouldn't a promotion of private education help create additional funds? Yes, but at what cost? I'm not a supporter of the private sector in education because at the end of the day, they are focused on profit first. My expectation from our government is that we understand and focus on the needs of the people. I appreciate your briefings and plans. We will reconvene at the budget meeting. It was a pleasure. See you at the meeting. I hope to see a change in direction. Did we cover all the necessary subjects? I wish to raise my concerns about your scheduled meeting with the Gestapo Chairman and former President Mr. Alfonso. There are significant considerations in the Darbell workforce and the broader community of Gestapo blue collar employees. This could be a strategic juncture to secure a triumph for the labor force. While I don't intend to overstep, I can't refrain from commenting on the labor pred predicaments experienced by workers in Gassan positions. Nevertheless, it's worth acknowledging that the corporation contributes substantially to job creation in regions struggling with poverty. Persuading the chairman to make concessions might prove to be a formidable task. Our aim should be a mutually beneficial outcome that advances both the economy and the interests of the laborers. Such an accomplishment would undoubtedly receive public acclaim, transcending political affiliations. The matter regarding laborers close to my heart. I would personally be grateful if you would be able to resolve this concerns raised by Katarina Horton and other laborers. It would be difficult to imagine someone like Alfonso obsessed with his corporation give benefits to workers without him personally gaining from it. Um, I mean, this is definitely true. In this world, nothing is truly free. I wouldn't anticipate anything less. We must be cautious about these seemingly generous offers. Beneath the surface, they usually come with hidden costs that further tip the scales in favor of the privileged few. Despite the potential divergence in interest, the door for dialogue among different sides should always remain open. I agree with that. It's important that ideology doesn't obscure our capacity to bring about tangible, effective transformation.
I've never given up in the face of adversity, especially when dealing with those who cling to power. We shall keep you no longer. Thank you both for the discussions. I do hope we won't repeat the same mistakes again and again. Have a good day, Mr. President. The ministers left and I prepared to leave for another official business in the city. The agenda for the next few days was busy. It also included the meeting with ministers Gus Manger and former President Alfonso at the Gassan branch office. As I made my way out, the weather was noticeably cold, but it didn't keep a group of USP supporters from coming out to cheer us on the streets. By looking at the citizens' attire, it was easy to understand the current state of Norbel. Some people were wearing clothes a few sizes too large. Some kids did not even have shoes. Yet there was hope in their eyes. They were excited to see the president in their city. Sword. Young Swords member found decapitated. Oh dear. The East Ward Police Department has found a decapitated body in an abandoned house where the victim was later identified as Kerr Glinke, a high school teacher and a member of the local Young Swords Cultural Center. The victim was discovered to be tortured with hot iron rods before his tongue was cut off. Police suspect the Red Youth are responsible for the incident. The incident has not been made public. That. Whew. That's not great. CPS and LUS strike against Kassam. In Narbel, the Communist Party of Sorlid and Labor Union of Sorlid have organized a strike against Kassam. Prominent figures Katarina Horton of the LUS and Dennis Stowler of CPS have confirmed their participation. The impact of the strike on Kassam's operations and the wider political climate in Narbel remains to be seen. Uh, labor strike at Kassam. Blue collar workers at Kassam and Narbel have initiated a labor strike. The industrial action follows disagreements over wages, working conditions, and workers' rights. The strike has resulted in a temporary disruption in Gassab's operations. The duration of the strike and the potential impact on Norbell's local economy are currently uncertain. Negotiations between Gassab management and the striking workers are reportedly ongoing. We'll have our meeting with Afonso and Manger now. After a series of intense meetings with Sierra and Pascal, I decided to take so much needed rest to recharge. In the capital, Lucian and Peter devoted themselves to the challenging task of uniting pro-centralization factions behind the drafting of a new constitution. Meanwhile, Gus Manger had invited me to visit the Gustav headquarters in Darbel. It was situated in Rorbol, a neighborhood on the city outskirts. Next to it was the Des Moines Gas Reserve, a prominent natural gas source consisting of four large fields. As our motorcade made its way through the Arnold district, I noted the neighborhood's state of disrepair. The community... The roads were bumpy and marked with potholes, while the buildings surrounded us appeared run down and dilapidated. The community had apparently endured a prolonged period of big luck. We came to a halt at the entrance of the facility, a sizable mural depicting the Gassab logo had been painted on a nearby wall. Adjacent to the mural, a group of individuals wearing blue work vests and a symbol told it to look like a protest sign. Search carefully parked the car, bringing our journey to a smooth and elegant conclusion. Guests greeted us warmly as we stepped out of the vehicle. Good day, President Ray. Welcome to Gassam's Narval operations. I trust the ministers at Walda and Brennawal didn't overwhelm you with their debates. Good to see you, Gus. I want to talk to you about what we can do to help the development here. Perfect. That's exactly what I was hoping to accomplish with today's discussions. My job is to improve the conditions of places like these. Mr. President, I've been brainstorming a little something the Grudy Rural Investment Plan. I reckon it's got the potential to bring new life into our rural communities out in Grunei. We should consider a few things. For starters, we could give the farming business a boost with some subsidies, or we could steal towards modernizing existing farms with machinery and tech. Or here's another thought. We could pour resources into developing crop breeds tailor-made for Grunei conditions. If it works out, we could roll this out across Swordland. He kept talking as he guided me into the Gassab building. Mr. President, I get the appeal of the Green Bill that's been making the rounds in the Assembly. But I'm telling you, if we put the brakes on that and funnel those funds into the Grudai plan instead, we could make some real strides without spooking any potential investors. I have my doubts, Gus. It's a tough call, Gus. I need to weigh the environmental implications of the economic benefits. That's all I'm asking for, Mr. President. Just give this plan a fair shake. Our talk was interrupted by a noise coming from outside the building. We looked out the nearest window. A sleek helicopter was cutting through the sky, sunlight glinting off its polished surface as it descended towards us. 
Uh, that was our next appointment, Iwaldo Fadzo. An extravagant show of wealth, isn't it? Hardly seems necessary. It's Alfonso style, Mr. President. He's always enjoyed his toys. Before we beat him, I wanted to bring up one more piece of assembly business. The workers' rights bill. Look, I'm all for giving hardworking folks what they deserve, but isn't it a bit hasty to push this while we're still stuck in a recession? The way I see it, short-term wins might have costing us big in the long run. It's an interesting perspective, Gus, but in my book, workers' rights aren't up for negotiation no matter the economic climate. So I'm not going to go with two. I'm going to say number three. Workers' rights aren't up for negotiation, no matter the economic climate. Mr. President, I respect your stance, but let's not forget about the potential fallout. There's got to be a way to prove workers' rights without rocking the economic boat. Please come this way. You all that I have some exciting news to share with you. I have faith that you won't leave us hanging. Said, I'm here because something needs to be done about Narbel's living standards. Of course, that's going to play a big role in our discussion. We have to be delicate with Gisab, though. A corporation this big is like a house of cards. You make one wrong move and the whole thing falls apart. Sometimes we must destroy a rotten foundations to build something better. I agree with that. Is it that paraphrasing Malinev? Keep in mind, we only have a single term to work with, and none of the average citizens here care about anything other than direct support. He pushed open a door. We walked out yet another hallway, see immediately in the direction we just come from. Like a maze, isn't it? The, that's Quinalia architecture for you. The hallways were lined with doors, glass petals in them, revealed workers in suits and ties, many of foreign origin, busy in their pristine offices. A stark contrast to the blue-collar workers outside working with machinery, transportation, and maintenance. Why are there so many workers from abroad? The best talent in Sorland was snatched by the SSC in the 1930s. Most other corporations couldn't get head, so they had to look elsewhere. Ah, here's the elevator. Ewald ought to be up there already. There's a separate entrance by the helipad. We stepped into the elevator, Gus punched it a code, and we began our ascent. Let's do this. The doors open. Here we are. Ewald, my friend. Ewald Afonso stood up from his chair. He had on a perfectly tailored suit that he wore as casually as pajamas. Gus, you old devil. It takes one to know one. As promised, I brought our guest of honor, President Ray, and I hope you enjoyed seeing our facilities here. The facilities appear to be in much better shape than the city around them. You should have seen Darbell before Gisab came here. The job it generated, the jobs it generated, have had a lasting positive effect. That's true. Things could be a lot worse. Please have a seat. Let's talk. We sat down. Some snacks and drinks were served. Multiple Gisab yearly financial reports were scattered on the table between us. 
President Reid, I'm here because we have a great opportunity there in our hands, a business arrangement that will benefit Kassab and Sorland alike. I also happen to believe that the current and former presidents of Sorland should stick together and share our experiences. Not everyone has been in our shoes, you know. Um... Let's put this pass aside, Ewald. I have a country to run. A sentiment I share, President Ray, the welfare of Sorlin must always be our top priority. That's the spirit, gentlemen. Sorlin is above most else. Am I right? As we discuss the future of Sorlin, it's paramount that I comprehend your vision. The trajectory you set for this country will inevitably impact not just Kassab, but also Sorlin's position on the global stage. I confess I've been following the news from Baruch Palace closely since leaving office. I'm heartened that your economic interests seem to align with mine. But I am puzzled that your administration has so far ignored the wealth of opportunities provided by the West. It's not a foreign policy direction I would have chosen. Meanwhile, I have not learned, I have not heard of any indication of your leanings regarding the Kingdom of Rizia's interest in investing in Gassam. I'd rather not hand over crucial components of our energy industry to foreign entities. Right. It is encouraging to hear your concern for Sorland's key industries, Mr. President. Maintaining control of these sectors is indeed crucial, but we must also consider the potential benefits that foreign investment might bring. Your concerns, Mr. President, remind me of a time when I was working with OMEC. We were bringing in foreign investments to revitalize the local companies. There were protests, people who were scared of change, we thought we were selling out, but we weathered the backlash stood by our decisions. Years later, the same people saw the benefits, the jobs we created, the growth we spurred. Change is always met with resistance, but at the end, it's the results that matter. That's a nice story, Gus, but we're not talking about a company here. We're talking about an entire nation. The stakes are much higher. You're right, Mr. President. But remember, a nation is also a conglomerate of all sorts of people, businesses, of hopes, and dreams. As Gus finished his point, we suddenly heard the fate wailing of Cyrus in the distance. He waited for the noise to fade before continuing. Back to the topic at hand. It seems we are at a crossroads with Gassam. The numbers tell a tale of struggle and potential. No need to sugarcoat it, Gus. Gassam is teetering on the edge of a cliff. Without a significant restructuring, the firm risks plunging into insurmountable debt. My old friend Ewald reached out to me for assistance. Out of respect for our shared history and my small stake in the company, I couldn't refuse. I've always believed in the power of networking. I'm sure you've heard of Rusty Batoro, chairman and CEO of Rizian or Royal Gold. Rusty and I go way back, and he's done quite well for himself. In fact, under Alfonso's government, I was able to broker a deal with King Robert Ramos Torres thanks to my connection with Rusty. It was a win for all involved. So I've heard, Gus. I understand the need for strategic alliances, but let's remember our own interests and values. Absolutely. We're in this for so that first and foremost, but remember, the world of international business alliances are tools, not ties that bind us. Thanks to Gus Razine's connections, investors from the kingdom are now interested in Gassama development that could steer us clear of the looming crisis. We've got an amazing opportunity here. The demand for gas is steadily increasing for both international partners and this sort of state. All we have to do is ensure a consistent supply. The trouble is that right now some of our fields are operating at only half their capacity due to resource limitations, but we have significant potential for expansion including two new fields that haven't even been tapped. The right amount of investment can expand resource extraction effectively fulfilling the rising demand and ensure long-term stability and profitability. But that requires us to be willing to take risks and weather the storm. Now that's a legacy we're striving for, wouldn't you agree? Um, I mean, I will say I'm intrigued. What's the potential return if we invest in the new areas? With proper investment development, we project extremely high returns in the first five years alone. The sound of sirens briefly distracted us. Through the window, we saw police cars driving down the street adjacent to the Gassab zone. We redirected our attention to the meeting. You all looked at me. Mr. President, I believe we have the potential for a mutually beneficial partner pa partnership. However, we need to align our objectives and expectations. You know, Mr. President, if we could get the government in on this, it's a win-win. 
Not only does the SCOM continue to operate and grow, but it also strengthens the state's energy, security, and economic power. We just need a little risk appetite, that's all. Are you ready, Mr. President, to take on the risks that come with ensuring one of Soros' most valuable energy companies continues to operate and grow? Are you ready to make your government stronger? I'm all for taking calculated risks, but we need to be sure that the benefits outweigh the potential losses. Of course, Mr. President, I would have proposed a strategy that I did believe would be beneficial for both Kassam and Sordlin. As someone who's been in the energy business for decades, I can tell you that this deal is solid. Mr. President, have you considered the future of Sordlin might not rest, might rest not on avoiding risks, but about embracing them? That our greatest potential might lie in the safety of what we know, but in the certainty of what we discover. Interesting concept. It's an interesting concept. I do believe you have to be bold in our decisions. Guess I'll go with two. If the Swedish government chooses to invest, it would gain a voice in the broader company decisions, even as a minority stakeholder. The government can either liquidate its shares at a future date or continue to reap the long-term profits as a beneficial arrangement for all parties. Ewald walked back over to the window. He stood there, silhouetted against the vast expanse of the gas fields. After a moment, he turned back to face us. His gaze was steady, the expectation clear in his eyes. The time had come to make a decision. Well, Mr. President, will Gassab and Sorlin make history or not? So I want to do number one. But we only have two government budget remaining. So, and I don't know when our budget's going to get updated. So I don't want to do number three. Because that, that seems bad. Right? So... I'm going to choose number two because It gives me a budget point left. A joint investment, a wise choice. It ensures steady funds for Gassam. 
I like the way you think, Mr. President. Sharing the cost with Rizia reduces our risk and strengthens our ties. It's a smart move. Before we dive into celebrations, I've allocated some time during this meeting for President Rain to discuss any concerns regarding Assam's treatment of its workers since it affects on our bell. The labor union, along with the Communist Party of Sword, that has rallied substantial support from Gassab workers in Arbel, advocating for improved local conditions. Alfonso nodded and looked at me. Um, our duty is to listen and to take action. That's the mandate granted to us by the public. While sometimes people may not always recognize what's in their best interest. Do you have a proposal in mind, Mr. President? Um... The wages of Gassab's blue-collar workers need to be increased. They are the backbone of your operation. President Ray, the welfare of our workers is certainly important. We'll continue to review their conditions and remuneration. We understand the importance of fair compensation. Discussions are ongoing and how best to support our hardworking employees. Both of you make good points. It's a fine line between fulfilling our responsibility and ensuring economic stability. It is a fine line indeed. So that doesn't absolve us or get some of our responsibilities towards the people of Narbel. Mr. President, I assure you that Gassab takes its responsibility. Suddenly the meeting was interrupted. The quiet murmur of a conversation from outside was the room grew louder, followed by the sound of hurried footsteps. A member of the private security team entered the room, his face tout with urgency. To the approach, Alfonso leaded to whisper something in his ear. E. Walden nodded solidly, his gaze beating mine with a serious intensity. Gentlemen, it seems we have an unexpected situation outside. Some protesters from the labor union have blocked the main vehicular exits. Katarina Horton and Dennis Stoller seem to be leading the group. It would be difficult to leave the way we came without causing trouble. Well, that's a pickle. What's our move now, Ewald? I have a helicopter ready. We can leave undetected and avoid the chaos and potential danger. Face the crowd head on. That is your prerogative, Mr. President. Following the violent events of late, I'm heavily recommended. I heavily recommend against facing any crowd. Mr. President, I advise you to leave by a helicopter just in case. I can stay back and update the crowd on the discussions today. Serge Wolt rushes in. Mr. President, I've discussed the situation with the Presidential Guard and the police security. They are advising us not to go out the way we came in. More police are on the way. We must take a decision, Mr. President. Everyone waited. The tense silence of the room stood in stark contrast to the buzz of the ever-growing crowd outside. I am going to face the crowd. A volatile situation has emerged outside the Gassab facility with a sizable crowd of protesters amassing their grievances fueled by underlying tensions present a complex scenario for us to navigate. A decision on our course of action can dramatically influence the outcome of the situation. We're going to face them, right? Because I feel like fleeing only would increase the situation that we don't care and I'm not there to listen to them. As we stepped out of the towering front gate of Gassab facility, I immediately became aware of how tense the situation was. Gus Major stood to my right, his silhouette barely distinguishable from the monolithic edifices behind me, behind us. Serge stood to my left, his eyes scanning the crowd with the precision of a hawk. The Gassab security had drawn their weapons in anticipation for me to bristly wall around the perimeter. My presidential guard, in stark contrast, stood tall and unflinching at the entrance, shielding us from the sea of angry workers surrounding us. The shouts of the crowd were deafening, the hostility palpable, Stoller and Horton stood at the forefront with fire in their eyes. With a deep breath, I prepared to address them. Gus extended a megaphone towards me.
My fellow swords, our presence today is not a guarantee of instant change, but rather an effort to better understand the complexity of the issues at hand. We recognize that words are not enough and only through concrete action can we begin to address the challenges you face. Okay, today's visit, let's be clear, does not mean all your problems will disappear overnight. It's an initial step to gauge the scope of the issues. I like that. Empty words, Rain, you've shown us nothing concrete today. We're fed up with your hollow rhetoric. All talk and no action. Isn't it, Mr. President? How long must the workers wait for real change? Now, hold on a minute. President Reid is committed to bringing about real change. His actions and decisions demonstrate this clearly, even if it doesn't fit your narrative. Is that so, Manager? All we've seen are decisions that favor the likes of you and Ewald Alfazo, not the common workers. It's not about narratives, Mr. Manager. It's about ensuring a fair, dignified life for the working class, something your policies have consistently failed to do. Dennis, the focus here is not on narrative or images, but on real tangible changes. It's a process, and we are on the right track. Words, words, and more words, President Reid. What the workers need are actions, not promises. Exactly, Dennis. The working class of Sorland is still waiting for those actions. Wasn't it your government that bailed out the elites while workers were left to suffer? Where was our bailout, Mr. President? And what about the recent campaign finance bill, Mr. President? It's a direct attack on democracy, effectively silencing small parties like ours. Your neglect of our nation's health care system will harm millions. Mr. President, we demand you support the upcoming workers' rights bill. The labor force of Sorland will be watching your next move closely. Furthermore, we want reform. Reduce the election threshold and change the Constitution to make a more democratic and fairer nation. All right, the campaign finance bill ensures fair funding for de democratically elected parties. It's not an attack on democracy, but a measure to safeguard it. Despite the sharp words exchanged, the crowd remained eerily calm. It seemed like they were waiting, their collective breath held in anticipation of something more. Suddenly, a reporter pushed through the crowd, brandishing a microphone towards me. The locals of Darbell have suffered under the impact of Gassab for years. What concrete steps is Gassab going to take for the benefit of the local community? The discussions with Gassam are an ongoing process, and I am committed to finding the best possible outcome for the workers of Darbell. Um, the journey may be challenging, but I remain dedicated. Our workers deserve better, and I won't rest until we achieve that. 
At least you're not hiding your lack of progress anymore. More determination won't solve the workers' problems. We need results. And until we get them, we will continue to fight. The crowd roared back to life. I could practically feel the raw anger emanating from them. My guards took a step forward. Time is a luxury you don't have, Mr. President. Each passing day is another day our, our workers suffer under the heels of inequality. The undercurrent of unrest swelled, threatening to surge into a full-blown tempest. The previous calm seemed like a distant memory, all illusions shattered by the harsh reality of discontent. A group of figures emerged from the crowd, adorned in unmistakable scarlet attire. The red youth had arrived. The sight of them transported me back to my days among the young swords and face us with those clad in crimson were frequent. I realized this was no longer a protest, it was a civil or broader, more potent struggle. The police began reorganizing their ranks, adopting defensive postures. Can you shed some light on the possible deal between the Swordish government and Gassab? What role does the Kingdom of Rizia play in this arrangement? We're sharing the costs and stakes with Rizia. This way, we're reducing financial pressure and fostering international relationships. A partnership with Rizia, you are aware of the monarchy's history of stamping out disagreements with brute force. We will be watching this code investment closely. Your government will be responsible for keeping its partners' worst tendencies in check. Closely, close by, I noticed a terse exchange between a security officer from Gassad, a member of the Presidential Guard. Serge craned his neck, his face deep in concentration as he listened to their whispers. Mr. President, the situation is growing increasingly volatile. I would recommend that we expedite your departure. We must prioritize your safety. Are you sure? We won't run it away from this. Only make the protesters angrier. Serge is right, Mr. President. The crowd won't get any calmer if you stick around. You've got to get to safety. Leaving so soon, Raid, I guess you know when you've been defeated. You can't even face your own people, can you, Mr. Raid? We expected better. These, I like all of these. Because they're all true. I'm going to go through. You claim to advocate for the workers that undermine our efforts to better their condition. Shouldn't you be supporting the initiatives we fought for instead of spreading discontent? One final question. What is your true personal relationship with E? Out of nowhere, a man lunged towards me from the crowd. Before I could react, Serge sprang in front of me. He swiftly tackled the man to the ground and pinned his hands behind his back. I'll say, everyone calm down. Serge left my gaze, attacked around the ground, and turned to the guards with a look of authority they never seen before. Protect the president. His voice carried over the screams of the crowd. The guards tightened their circle around me, hurriedly pushing me towards the safety of the convoy. Everyone, remain calm, says Dennis. Police and security forces rushed into the belly, swinging batons with indiscriminate ferocity. The red youth rushed at them head on. Enter the car, Mr. President. We are leaving now. Katarina and Dennis raised their hands in a plea for call, their words nearly lost amidst the turmoil. Stop the cops. This isn't going to help. Guest manager, back off. You're only making things worse. The staff and I were swiftly escorted to the convoy. The protesters and police scattered as their vehicles plowed through the crowd. Their screams receded into the background as we left the chaotic scene behind. Okay, then. Well, that is where we're going to end the episode, where that backfired spectacularly. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody who watched, and I will talk to you all later.